Well, thank you very much for the invitation to come here and thank you all for showing up just a few days before Christmas. I'm sure you have other things to do, but I'm glad you're here. Um, I should warn you, you have to see the screens. So if you're in a seat from which it is difficult to see either one of those screens, you should move now. This is your last, your one chance to do that. Okay, um, I should also warn you that even though the lecture is entitled The Origins of Inequality, I'm not going to talk a whole lot about origins. Um, I mostly title it this way because the motto of this, the lecture series is origins, and so I thought it would fit in better this way. Uh, what I would like to do over the next hour or so is take you through a very rapid survey of the evolution of resource inequality, inequality in terms of wealth and income, uh, in the very long term, going back tens of thousands of years from the Stone Age to the present, and then address a very important pressing question, a very big concern for us today, certainly in my country, now the US, but all over the world, which is rising inequality in wealth and income, increasing stratification. And what I will try to do is identify mechanisms which from a long-term historical perspective have been effective in reducing inequality to a significant degree, at least for a certain amount of time. And this will take us back from the present into the more distant past. I guess my overall goal is to convince you that pre-modern history has something significant to contribute to our understanding of present day concerns and problems. Now, it's always important in the beginning um, to define our terms. So when I talk about inequality, well, inequality manifests itself in different ways, depending on what kind of assets, what kind of resources you're talking about. There are certainly assets, resources that I call somatic. They reside within the human body. And of course, people differ quite a lot in that respect. They have different strength and intelligence and sexual appeal and um, social capabilities and so on. And that's the most fundamental determinant, in a way, of inequality. And then there are extra somatic resources, resources that physically reside outside the human body, relational resources, people's connections to others that are a very important determinant of their success in life, their standing in society, and so on. And then what is historically the most recent type of asset, of resource is material wealth, any kind of physical objects that people claim to control, going back to the Paleolithic, and of course more recently real estate, livestock, money, equities, all the things that make up our fortunes today. Now in the most general terms, it's certainly fair to say that somatic wealth, a physical uh, mental properties used to be much more important in the past. The same is true of re relational uh, resources, certainly compared to material wealth. If you go back far enough in time, there isn't a whole lot of material wealth around. And so even the theoretical capacity for inequality is actually fairly limited. And on top of that, there are powerful social controls against uh, the unequal distribution of those resources that did in fact exist. At the same time, and I think that's important to emphasize because of what you often see in the literature, we shouldn't overestimate the egalitarianism of ancestral hunter-gatherers. It's interesting because part of the slide is red on my screen, but it's all black up here, but it doesn't really matter. Um, this is a problem that arises from focusing on a contemporary hunter-gatherer societies. In order to find observed forages today, you have to go to very remote places, to the Amazon rainforest or the Arctic Circle or the Kalahari Desert and so on. And you'll find groups that are small in size, they live in very marginal environments, geographically, ecologically marginal. And so it's not surprising that these groups are very impoverished by our uh, modern standards. And in addition to that, they often assert an egalitarian spirit to set themselves apart from uh, sedentary societies. Now, this is not necessarily representative of conditions among ancestral 
hunter-gatherers before the emergence of agriculture from about 10 or 12,000 years ago. Because back then there were hunter-gatherers all over the world inhabiting uh, very resource-rich environments, including, in fact, uh, this area here, uh, the south of France, uh, all kinds of really nice areas where it was already in the distant past possible to accumulate a larger quantity of resources. Perhaps the most striking example is this. It's a very early example, 24,000 years ago, uh, burials of two children uh, from the last ice age. These are Pleistocene uh, hunter-gatherers, people who used to hunt the woolly mammoth uh, at the fringes of the ice cap during the last ice age. And what's striking about them is these are children. They are 10 or 12 years old. And these skeletons are covered from head to toe in thousands of beads, beads manufactured of the tusks of the woolly mammoth. And if you imagine technology 24,000 years ago, it would have taken a lot of time and effort to manufacture thousands of beads out of these hard tusks. And what's striking is that these decorated individuals are children. So they are not marked as special because of something they did during their lifetime, because of their accomplishments as leaders or shamans or whatever. They are marked out as special because they are the children of someone important. And that all by itself implies a fair amount of inequality, of stratification in terms of power and, we, as we can see, in terms of material wealth. So there is uh, a fair amount of inequality probably already out there tens of thousands of years ago, which is hard for us to track. That said, it is certainly true that with the transition to uh, farming or pastoralism, uh, the amount of extrasomatic wealth, of material resources, people's possessions outside their own bodies, increases uh, quite considerably. Now, this is something not just in a way, logically inevitable and well documented in the archaeological and later historical record. It is now formally uh, being studied um, foremost by a, a collaborative project out of UC, um, was it? Davis and uh, the Santa Fe Institute, a cross-cultural study of about two dozen small-scale societies at different levels of development, uh, foragers, horticulturalists, farmers, herders in different parts of the globe, as you can see, um, all over the world. And what the study seeks to do is to uh, explain observed variation in resource inequality. Uh, across the globe. And the result is that this variation in inequality is caused by two factors. One is the dominant type of wealth, which is ultimately a function of prevailing technology. Where in hunter-gatherer societies or early horticulturalists, while there isn't all that much material wealth around, the critical determinants are somatic um, assets, relational uh, wealth, and so on. Whereas once you look at agrarian or pastoral societies, material wealth, possession of land, of animals, of livestock, becomes much more crucial. Well, that you have to combine with the dominant type of wealth transmission, in as much as these resources could, in fact, be transmitted to other people. And of course, wealth transmission is inevitably rather limited and diffused in these early societies. Somatic properties can't really be properly transmitted except through to, uh, reproduction in a rather imperfect way. And in as much as people control material resources, uh, material wealth, they tend to uh, distribute it laterally, give it away to their peers rather than pass it on to the next generation. It is only with agriculturalism um, or herding that people start to focus on the transgenerational transmission of wealth directed to kin offspring in the next generation. And the way this is being done is determined by the norms and institutions that apply in a particular environment. And the combination of these factors accounts for observed variation in inequality. Now, it is easy to understand why wealth transmission from one generation to the next and the emergence of inequality in terms of wealth and income are causally connected. 
Uh, this is something that the study um, modeled, uh, simulated uh, formally. The idea is once you have multi-generational wealth transmission within families, within lineages from one generation to the next, well, these families will be subject to external shocks. Some of these families will be lucky, they will have good land, and they will be healthy and smart and well-liked and successful, and so on, and others will be unlucky. They will have accidents, and they will be sick, and the locusts will eat their crops, and so on. And these differences will, over time, become entrenched and account uh, for increasing stratification and inequality. Now, this, of course, leaves out a critical question, which is uh, why societies would accept intergenerational wealth transmission in the first place. Well, that's a very big question that we can really, at present, only conjecture about, and which I will leave out for the moment. Now, as a result of this, we can fill in uh, the first half of what I call a brief history of inequality on one slide, because my ambition is to put everything you need to know on a single slide, which is an eco economical way of doing things, I guess. So you have limited inequality amongst hunter-gatherers, even though we shouldn't overestimate it, and then increasing inequality with the transition to food production based on farming and herding. Now, in theoretical terms, it's easy to understand why inequality would go up with increasing economic development. This is a concept developed by a friend of mine, the economist Branko Milanovic at the World Bank, something he calls the inequality possibility frontier. And it's easy to explain how this works. Um, if you look, let's see if this actually works. Yes, uh, on the x-axis, uh, you have uh, the average output, uh, the average um, income uh, per capita in terms of minimum subsistence. So one would be uh, the average output per capita is the absolute minimum needed in order to get by to survive and reproduce at replacement level. And the y-axis is the uh, degree of inequality uh, going up in this direction. So if you have a society where everybody lives at absolute minimum subsistence, logically there can't really be any resource inequality. Because if even one person has a little more, someone else is going to have less than absolute minimum subsistence and is going to starve, which I guess could happen in practice, but it wouldn't be sustainable in the long term. Well, once you have a society uh, where, average out, where average output is twice uh, minimum subsistence, it is in theory possible that one person controls one half of all income and everybody else has to share the other half. So the, uh, everybody would live at minimum subsistence except for the one person who controls half of all income. And so the theoretical degree or the, the Gini coefficient in this case could be as high as 0.5. And then as per capita income goes up, the theoretical maximum possible amount of inequality goes up as well. But not in a linear fashion, it's an asymptotic curve. Now what's interesting here is that even though the potential for inequality steadily increases with economic development, the actual degree of inequality doesn't uh, increase nearly as quickly. Uh, this is a rather conjectural uh, reconstruction of degrees of both per capita income and inequality in a number of historical, uh, pre-modern, mostly in fact, entirely agrarian societies. You can see that many of these societies are very poor. Uh, they live, uh, on average, very close to bare subsistence. They have experienced fairly high levels of inequality in as much as actual inequality is about as high as it can possibly be. So these societies are very poor on average, but the resources that do exist are very strongly captured by a small segment of the population, and everybody else is fairly destitute. Now, as some of these pre-modern societies experience economic development, in other words, they move to the right, the right on the x-axis, um, 
Inequality goes up as well. This is the case of England. This is England in the high middle ages, moving up into, what is this, 1800. Uh, this is the Netherlands up here. You can see as these economies grow in per capita terms, they become somewhat more unequal they're very close together, somewhat more unequal, but not as unequal as they could theoretically have been. And it's very easy to understand why, because you can't really have a more affluent economy where one person controls all the surplus and everybody else is dirt poor. At least you can't have this prior to the oil industry. This is not an economy that could arise in an agrarian environment. Now, I could give a whole lecture about um, evidence supporting the notion that with economic growth over thousands of years in agrarian societies, uh, inequality tends to go up. This is just a single example drawn from early modern France in the 16th and 17th century. And this is an, an example that looks at proxy data. Because for historians, it's often very difficult to actually measure in any meaningful way actual income inequality in past centuries. And so we often rely on uh, indirect evidence, on proxy data, to draw conclusions about inequality. And here, body height is a very suitable metric, stat here, because it is meaningfully related to physical well-being, to levels of income, inequality, and so on. It's a more complicated story, so this is a simplified version, but there is a strong relationship between uh, income and stat here. And you can see in the case of early modern France, uh, if you look at the, the class strat stratification of body height, uh, people in the poorest segment of the population, workers, are uh, on average almost two centimeters shorter than whatever the trend height would have been in France at the time. And people in the top social class, nobility, landowners, and so on, are almost two centimeters taller. So there's a systematic difference of 3.5% in average adult body height between the richest and the poorest segment of the population. Now you might think that 3.5%, which is about this much, isn't a whole lot. But it's actually a lot because if you go back um, a few hundred years, even rich people found it difficult to convert their wealth into substantially better bodies and better health because uh, public health was essentially non-existent, medicine was very ineffectual. So a three and a half uh, centimeter difference under those circumstances is actually quite dramatic and reflects high levels of inequality overall. Now, of course, this is a development that was uh, captured quite some time ago by the American uh, economist Simon Kuznets, who came up with the idea uh, of the Kuznets curve that as economic development occurs, inequality will tend to go up. This already happens in pre-industrial societies over time, and it becomes more intense during the transition to an industrial economy. For obvious reasons, I don't have to belabor uh, in this context because a few people are going to benefit disproportionately from early capitalism uh, from this transition. Everybody will be better off, but a few people will be dramatically better off than everybody else. But then eventually, and this is the rather optimistic message of this particular model, uh, inequality is going to decline as industrial economies mature, the argument being that a larger share of the workforce is going to move into higher skilled jobs, they need more education, command higher wages, uh, there are policy measures accompanying them, unionization, more democracy, legislation, any number of things that will compress overall inequality, or so the model says. Of course, there's a bit of a glitch in that this development has recently been reversed in quite a few countries. Now, ostensibly, at first sight, there's a fair amount of empirical evidence in support of this particular assumption. Uh, this is uh, average per capita income here. This is the deg degree of inequality. And you can see uh, one thing that low income and high income economies have in common is relatively moderate levels of inequality compared to e transitional economies, middle income economies that are transitioning to industrialism and they temporarily experience uh, higher degrees of inequality. Every dot here would be a different country at a given point in time. So it seems as if there is strong support 
uh, for this kind of reconstruction. And certainly the first half of this, the upward curve where inequality gets worse with uh, in, um, in early industrialization, well, that's extremely well documented empirically. I'll just give you a single example from England and Wales where you can see the share that the richest 1% of the population control of total national wealth, well, that goes up for hundreds of years. It's about 40% in 1700, and it's as high as 70% on the eve of World War I. So this predates industrialization, but actually gets worse with industrial development. Well, as a result of this, you get a uh, more extreme uh, disparity in physical well-being as well. I mentioned body height before. Uh, the difference now becomes much more pronounced. The average difference at age 16 for, for uh, young males in England between the richest and the poorest class is 22 centimeters. That's a pretty substantial uh, amount of height because at this point the rich can actually purchase much better health and it's reflected in their physical well-being. You have also increasing disparities in all industrializing countries, that's just one example, using proxy data from France, where one index of inequality goes up hugely between 1850 and the time of World War II, largely as a result of industrialization. Well, so far, so good. So we can fill in more um, in this slide that you have increasing inequality with the transition to a modern industrial economy. But eventually, this process will be attenuated or, in fact, reversed. Uh, the other things I don't really have much time to talk about. There's an increase in international inequality inequality between countries because countries start developing or industrializing at different points in time and that increases the global uh, extent of inequality. But more recently, of course, this trend uh, also um, it hasn't quite begun to uh, reverse, but it has certainly stalled with the development of China and so on. Now, this is ultimately an optimistic story. The story being that, well, if you wait long enough, inequality is going to go down as a function of economic development. There is, of course, an obvious problem with the story illustrated by the slide, which, well, everybody in the US at least has seen many times at this point because it's all over the media and has been for a number of years, which is that, of course, in the last generation or so, income inequality has increased quite dramatically. It was very high 100 years ago in the early 20th century when the richest 1% of the US population captured about 20% of all income. It then went down uh, in the first half of the 20th century to about 10%. This is what motivated Kuznets and others to say, well, this is the result of a maturing industrial system. But of course, more recently, it has gone up again and is now at the same level uh, where it was 100 years ago. So this is rather difficult um, to explain if you believe that a reduction in inequality is a function of industrial, of economic development. It's a development that is true of very many countries. It's particularly pronounced in Anglophone countries, US, Canada, Australia, um, uh, Canada, and so on, South Africa, where you always have the same trend, high inequality early on, a great uh, reduction in the middle of the 20th century, and a quite strong increase in the last 20 or 30 years. The same is true of other European countries, southern European countries. The trend is the same. The scale, of course, is more limited. You have the same in developing countries, China, uh, India, and so on. The only a few holdouts, including, of course, France, uh, Japan, where it seems at this level of resolution, inequality used to be high, but it's much lower now, and low levels have been successfully maintained. But that's really, uh, to some extent, only a matter of resolution. If you look at the French data, for instance, for the top 0.1% of the income distribution, one person out of 1,000, the very richest people in France, you can see over the last 30 years, you have the exact, the exact same trend uh, that their share in national income has gone up from about 7% to about 9 or 10%. So that's a far cry from what has happened in the US and Anglophone countries, but the overall trend is pretty much the same everywhere in the world.
So this allows us to fill in the last bit that this trend in inequality reduction has recently been reversed. Now, this is a big problem for the optimistic assumption, as I said, that uh, in mature uh, industrialization, economic development will cause a decline in inequality almost automatically. And as a result of this, this notion has increasingly come under fire, especially, and this is the hero of the story here, someone at Paris, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to reference someone, an economist at Paris, but it's really done, uh, critical work on this, proposing not just a complementary, but an alternative cause for the observed of, uh, decline in inequality in the first half of the 20th century, which is that all these uh, major industrial economists experienced violent, exogenous shocks that drove down inequality in a way that would not otherwise have happened. Now, I use here the case of Japan, not because there's anything special about Japan, but because the Japanese scenario uh, illustrates this process in a very pure, dramatic, almost ideal, typical way. This is the share of national income in Japan captured by the richest 1% of the population. Of course, what happened in Japan is it industrializes in the late 19th century. It still had a fairly archaic, uh, stratified uh, social system where a small number of people captured the benefits of this particular development. And so as a result, in the early 20th century, inequality is very high. The richest 1% capture about 20% of all income, the same as in the US at roughly the same time. Well, then everything changes in the period of only eight years between 1937 and 1945. In this period, the share in all income of the top 1% drops from 20% to 6%, and it stays quite low and only recently has begun to creep up. So what happened in 1937? In 1937, Japan invaded China, the idea being that Japan would take over as much of China as possible, ideally the entire country. That, of course, committed Japan to an enormous war effort that could barely be sustained by the Japanese economy at um, the time. And then, of course, things get even worse in 1941 with Pearl Harbor and entry into uh, World War II proper. What happens during this period is that the Japanese government is compelled to resort to very extraordinary measures. It has to tax uh, the richest segment of the population at extremely high rates, in excess of 90%, uh, levy high rates of taxation on inheritances, gifts, uh, forcibly redistribute property, impose uh, controls on prices, on executive pay, uh, there's a massive redistribution from the rich to the general population to draft millions of people into the military, support the war effort, and so on. On top of this, you have increasing inflation because the government can't actually fund this huge war effort out of actual revenue. And on top of that, in the final year of the war, you have massive physical destruction of the infrastructure because of US bombing uh, and much of the housing stock, many of the factories that are being destroyed, of course, were owned by the richest people in Japan. So all these things together caused the, the wealth, the income, uh, of the richest Japanese to decline very dramatically in this eight-year period. And so by the time the dust settles in late 1945, the richest Japanese are vastly less rich than they used to be less than a decade earlier. And then the Americans come in, establish the occupation government, and make many of these emergency measures permanent because it was, they felt it was a good idea to keep the old elite from returning to power. So they keep tax rates high, encourage unionization, redistribute land, do all kinds of things that contain income inequality. Now, the same things with a certain degree of variation happen in all the major industrial countries uh, in the world in roughly the same period. I'm only going to illustrate this very superficially. You have a similar situation in the United Kingdom where income inequality is very high as recently as the 1930s. 
and contracts massively during World War II for the same reasons. The government has to levy enormous taxes. There is inflation. And after the war, as part of the bargain between the state and the population, uh, there's a big expansion of the welfare state and so on. And taxes don't really start going up till uh, the 1980s. This is a better illustration of why this happens. Um, it shows the income share of the very richest people in Britain, the top 5%, top 0.1%, and so on. You can see that the most important periods of decline in their share in overall income are during the two wars, first in World War I, and then more dramatically during World War II. And that is directly related uh, to fiscal policies driven by the war effort and then uh, entrenched over time. The same happens in France with certain modifications. Again, income inequality is very high at the beginning of World War I. 20% of all income go to the top 1%. Same rate as in Japan, same rate as in the US. There's already some contraction during World War I because an income tax is introduced for the first time. There's massive erosion of elite incomes after the war because there are years of high inflation in the 1920s. And then, of course, German occupation in the early 1940s has a very, very uh, negative effect on elite income because the Germans tried to squeeze as many resources out of France as possible. And again, after the war, because of policy measure, uh, this becomes stabilized. There are other ways of measuring the same thing. This is a 200-year um, um, survey of the amount of um, disposable income in France from 1820 to the present that derived from inherited wealth. This is essentially uh, the rentier class, the kind of people that Balzac and Proust and so on wrote about, people who live off inherited income. And they used to capture about 20, 25% of all disposable income. And this class pretty much disappears in just a few years during World War I because they are so hard hit uh, by the fiscal measures imposed by the war. And then again, it happens on a lesser scale uh, during World War II. That's another measure of the same thing. Uh, this is estates, uh, inheritances in Paris over the last 200 years, uh, showing the share of the total value of all inheritances made up by the top 1% of all estates. And so you can say the richest estates account between 50 and 70% of all inheritances in France. It's an upward trend all the way up to 1913, the beginning of World War I. And then the share uh, collapses quite dramatically during World War I and II, again, for the same reason, because capital is so heavily taxed as inflation and so on. So wherever you look, uh, you find the same picture, Japan, France, United States, you have this very sudden dramatic reduction in income inequality between 1914 and 1945, and is directly causally linked uh, to the war effort, the fiscal measures it brings, uh, inflation, in some cases physical destruction, and so on. Now, it's clear to see why. This is the, the mirror image of the same development. Uh, when war breaks out, total war breaks out, marginal uh, tax rates uh, shoot up to levels that would not otherwise be politically sustainable. When World War I is over, they go down, but they don't go down nearly as far as they were prior to the war. And then World War II necessitates even higher levels of taxation, which are then stabilized for about a generation or so till the end of the Cold War. Another way of illustrating this, of course, is how the fiscal size, if you will, of the state increases in response to warfare. This is uh, the, uh, the share in GDP captured by the federal government in the United States since uh, 1902. You can see that prior to World War I, the federal government seizes only 2 or 3% of GDP in the form of direct uh, taxation. This rate goes up quite a bit during World War I, goes down again, but only by about half, and then shoots up dramatically uh, during World War II, and then remains high, uh, not just because of Korea and Vietnam and the Cold War, but largely to support the welfare state. <clears throat> 
Now you can track this back even further in time. The point being that uh, big wars are the only mechanism in this context that are capable of driving up uh, tax rates, driving up the share of GDP claimed by the state. You see this quite clearly in the US. Uh, the Civil War is the first uh, significant episode in this respect, where income tax is introduced for the first time in US history. Of course, income state income goes down after the war, but not at the same level as before. And then you have the increases in World War I and World War II. The same happens in other countries. It happens in Britain earlier, when income taxes created about 200 years ago in the wars against Napoleon. Uh, the overall pattern is the same wherever you have halfway decent data. So the logical implication of this is, None of this would have happened in quite the same way had these very big wars not occurred, had they not both compelled and enabled state governments to greatly increase uh, state revenue in real terms, and that in turn had the effect of compressing income inequality. Now this does not mean that war in general has the effect of lowering income or wealth inequality. It appears, as far as I can tell from my own historical survey, that only a particular type of war tends to have that effect. A kind of war that involves mass mobilization, a kind of war you have in World War I, World War II, uh, before the Civil War in the US, and so on. A war where the state has to raise demands on the rich because that's in a, in, a, in, a, in a dramatic fashion because that's the only way to pay for it, where there has to be a massive uh, increase in redistribution to the poor to fund army service and persuade the population to commit uh, to a total war effort. It's something that favors state centralization, makes it easier for the state uh, to tax rich people who are otherwise very adept at um, escaping, avoiding their various obligations. That's a typical feature of all pre-modern societies. It is something that disfavors elite entitlements. It's in time of these massive crises that the state is able to uh, cut back, uh, push back uh, traditional feudal rights, privileges of the, of the richest segment of the population, and something that favors entitlements uh, for the poor, with the property rights, protection, democracy uh, later on. Any number of things are causally related to mass mobilization in these wars. Now, historically speaking, this type of war is not very common. It is historically a fairly modern, a fairly recent phenomenon that in Europe goes back essentially to the French Revolution. It's really uh, the levé en masse uh, in, in the late 18th century that uh, creates this phenomenon for the first time so that Napoleon can have his big armies and so on. It's very rare to find this kind of event in earlier periods of history, but it's not entirely unheard of. The earliest historical antecedents that I can think of is the situation in warring states China, uh, the period in the 5th, 4th, 3rd centuries BC, uh, when in China you have about six or seven major kingdoms in what is now central eastern China engaged in generations, in centuries of increasingly large-scale warfare. It's what I call symmetrical warfare because the kingdoms are organized in similar ways. They raise ever larger infantry armies engaging in these prolonged uh, campaigns, uh, armies sustained by conscription of the general population. So they're in some ways quite similar to the mass mobilization wars in Europe in the last 200 years. And we have very good evidence for the political, social, economic consequences of these mass mobilization infantry wars, the suppression of hereditary nobility and feudal rights, the state cracks down on elite privilege, tries to disempower uh, a powerful uh, people outside the central government, uh, the imposition of direct taxation, uh, census taking, uh, Peasants are given secure property rights as a reward for their commitment to the war effort because there's a bargaining process ultimately between the government and the general population to make this intense commitment happen. And when one side is victorious, 
conquered land is being reallocated to the infantry uh, soldiers who serve in these armies. Now, of course, we can't go and actually literally measure the Gini coefficient in warring states China, but there can be little doubt that all these things together have a very substantial dampening effect on income on wealth and income inequality. The aristocracy is certainly less powerful, less rich at the end of this period than it was before, and the general population enjoys uh, somewhat higher incomes. But it's actually very difficult to find similar uh, cases, similar examples in other periods of history. What is much more common in history is a kind of war that leads to the creation of what we call tributary empires. All the major traditional societies you can think of from Pharaonic Egypt onwards, the Roman Empire and the Arab conquests and China and the Aztecs and the Inca, uh, that all more or less follow the same pattern which is that the bigger these empires become, the more successful they are, the more territory, the more people they incorporate, the more they raise inequality on the winning side in the imperial core. Because what happens is that the ruling class, the leadership in the imperial uh, core will, of course, benefit disproportionately from plunder, uh, the inflow of revenue in the form of rent and taxation. And at the same time, even if the general population only also benefits to some extent, there's often an inflow of extremely poor people at the same time, of war captives, deportees, chattel slaves in those systems where slavery is a, as an accepted institution. And so as a result, income at the very top goes up, and in addition, there are more poor people than before. And so inevitably, this must have the effect of increasing overall inequality in wealth and income at the imperial core. Now, you might argue that um, the opposite effect could be observed on the losing side. If territories, populations are incorporated into those large empires, it may well be that their local elites suffer disproportionately because it's easy for the conquering side to take away their property because that's the easiest way of uh, collecting resources. But at the same time, once these territories become part of a larger system, if you look at the entire system, the core and the various subjugated peripheries, while well, the entire system is again much more unequal overall than it was before, because now you have a small elite group for the entire area, and that by itself will again increase inequality in terms of wealth and income. And it would actually be quite um, easy to illustrate this, at least in qualitative terms, I just give a single example of the case of the Roman Empire, which is very big, lasts for a very long time, and we can see as it matures, as it exists for hundreds of years, there is increasing concentration of income at the very top of society. We have certain reported figures for the annual income of what I call middling aristocrats, not the super rich, but people who are so regular members of the ruling class of the Roman Empire, here denominated in a standardized form. The denomination doesn't really matter. All you can see is that the actual amounts go up over time. They're in six figures in the first century BC. They're closer to a million 150 years later. By the time you reach late antiquity, they are already in the high seven figures. So the rich keep getting richer over time. At the same time, there is no indication everybody else gets richer um, as well. In fact, there's now a big project uh, looking at body height in the Roman Empire, how it changed over time. And you can see that during the same period, people all over the Roman Empire become progressively shorter. So they are more and more impoverished under more and more scarcity pressures, whereas at the same time, income is increasingly concentrated at the very top. So again, while we can't directly measure the Gini coefficient of the Roman Empire, it's clear that inequality goes up the longer the empire is around. I also had a graduate student at Stanford who just finished that dissertation uh, looking at housing size, the size of people's houses in different parts of the Roman world before, during, and after the Roman period. And what he finds was that consistently houses in the Roman period are on average 
bigger than before and after, but they are also, the sizes are more unevenly distributed. Uh, there are a small number of very large mansions and a larger number of smaller uh, dwellings, like you know, the villas that you have here around uh, Toulouse, for instance. What's the one called? In the museum, there's, if you go to the Raymond Museum, you have a whole floor uh, full of exhibits drawn from one such villa, which is a very good illustration of income uh, concentration at the top. So, we have one mechanism that can reduce inequality, which is mass mobilization wars, which are historically rare. Another mechanism, unsurprisingly, are transformative revolutions like the Russian Revolution, Mao, Fidel Castro, the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia, and so on. The earliest instance being, in a way, the French Revolution, which, and there's an abundance of evidence for this, has the effect of reducing inequality in wealth and income quite a bit in the course of about 25 years between the revolution and the end of the Napoleonic era. That is due to any number of things, uh, changes in the tax system, the confiscation of much of the wealth of the aristocracy and uh, the church, which is auctioned off uh, to people who belong largely to the middle classes, increases in the real incomes of workers because of the scarcity produced by the wars, inflation that benefits tenants who pay rent in depreciated currency, and so on. All these things cumulatively have the effect of decreasing the income share of the upper classes of the richest people in society, at least for a time, because that process is reversed with industrialization. Now, once again, these transformative revolutions are not very common in world history. It's actually very difficult to find comparable examples prior to the French Revolution. They may have existed, but they can't have been very common. It's important to note that unlike these very dramatic revolutions, civil wars as such do not, on average, have the effect of lowering inequality. We know this because, uh, thanks largely to a very recent study that looked at a very large number of cases over the last 50 years or so, and they find that on average, civil wars tend to have the effect of increasing income inequality both during and right after these wars. It's actually quite easy to see why. Uh, there is uncontrolled profiteering. There are some people who benefit a lot from being on the winning side in a civil war, but the state at the same time is very weak, and so the state can't tax away uh, these additional resources. Uh, the poor suffer because the war, the violence interferes with their access to markets, information, and so on, and redistributed Redistributive processes are sustained by the state while well, they suffer as well, inasmuch as states are break down or are weakened during these episodes of civil war. So civil war as such does not have a dampening effect on income inequality, only rather dramatic revolutions. Well, there's a third mechanism, which is rather different in nature, that can have the effect of reducing income inequality, which is very massive pandemics uh, that cause big demographic contractions, killing off a large share of the population, thereby changing the ratio of labor to land, uh, alleviating Malthusian pressures, and so on. Most famous example, of course, being the Black Death, the bubonic plague that appears in Europe in the middle of the fourth, uh, 14th century, killing off about a third of the population of Western Europe. This has a, a well-documented effect on the real incomes of certain types of workers, people who work for wages. Uh, real incomes are low right before the Black Death in the High Middle Ages. Following the Black Death, they go up for about 100 years. The people who survive enjoy higher wages because they have a better bargaining power. The bargaining power of the landlords and so on diminishes. And then, of course, eventually the plague will go away. The population will recover. Real wages will go down. And all of this, of course, this is not just real wages. This is also a reflection of levels of inequality. The poor are less poor after the Black Death uh, in terms of income, their physical well-being, their nutrition, their housing, any number of things. And the rich are in a less uh, dominant position. The same is true already early on. This is a, a data series I put together 
uh, for Egypt going back to the third century BC, where we are able to track the incomes, the salaries of workers, of unskilled agrarian laborers, who for, the, for a very long period of time, for more than a thousand years, would usually earn just enough to get by, just enough to be able to survive and work, about four liters of wheat a day. The one exception is a, a huge increase in their real wages in the uh, sixth and seventh centuries AD, which is the first iteration of the Black Death, the first time bubonic plague appears in Western Eurasia, killing off lots of people, making the survivors better off as a result, reducing in inequality, at least temporarily. Uh, this is also reflected in, again, statia, in body height, uh, this is a time series of 2,000 years tracking changes in average adult body height in different parts of Europe. You can see if you go back far enough to the Roman period that there are lots of people, high population density, lots of infectious disease, high inequality. People are stunted. They are short as a result. Then you have the plague. There are fewer people. The survivors are better off and they are taller. They have better bodies as a result. Then they shrink again in the high Middle Ages as the population recovers. And then they grow again quite dramatically in the wake of the Black Death because they are better off, their higher real incomes, and inequality is reduced. So now we have three mechanisms that reduce inequality. Mass mobilization wars, transformative revolutions, and major epidemics, which are all pretty grim kind of uh, features. Are there any other mechanisms that can have the same effect? It doesn't really seem so. Um, one candidate, which seems a bit exotic, is the abolition of slavery. And it's easy to see how this would work. If you have a large-scale slave system where the richest uh, people in society own lots of slaves, well, inequality will be high. If you abolish slavery, all of a sudden, the rich will be less rich than before, at least technically, and uh, the slaves will no longer be formally property-less, and so on. So this, all by itself, will compress income inequality. That's, in fact, what you see in the US, where overall, both for the North and the South taken together, inequality right after the Civil War is significantly lower uh, than right before the Civil War, which is largely a function of the abolition of slavery in the South, and to some extent, of course, also a function of mobilization during the Civil War. Well, that's not something that happens very often, because you need a large-scale slave society, and it's something that can only happen once, for rather obvious reasons. Financial crises, as we now know, do not normally uh, compress income inequality. The Great Depression does a little bit in the US in the 1930s, but generally financial crises cause only very temporary uh, corrections. We've seen this recently in the US after the 9-11 um, stock market uh, downturn during the financial crisis of 2007 and 8. The very richest people in society for about a year or two make slightly less money money, and then they recover very rapidly and eventually make more, capture a larger share of total national income than they did before. So the question is, are there any built-in checks? Um, if inequality gets bad enough, um, are there any countervailing forces that are, in a way, endogenous to this kind of development? If you get a high degree of inequality, will that somehow trigger violent internal resistance, that people rise up uh, um, in order to use force uh, to change the situation? And of course, scholarship has long been concerned with this question. Early literature tended to argue that there is, in fact, a positive relationship, that increasing inequality increases the risk of civil war, of violence within a state. But that, in fact, has been uh, to some extent discredited by the most recent, most comprehensive surveys. The point, of course, is that even if rising inequality caused more civil wars, as we just saw a few minutes ago, civil wars as such do not by themselves reduce inequality. So if, if you get a civil war as the result of inequality, it is not actually going to address the problem. On average, it's going to make the problem worse by increasing inequality even further. So, why am I telling you all this? Um, 
there are, I think, um, only a very limited number of mechanisms which we can show from taking a very long-term historical perspective are effective in really significantly reducing income inequality, mass mobilization wars, transformative revolutions, major epidemics, and the abolition of slavery. Now, none of these mechanisms are available to us today, nor, I think, should we wish them to be available to us, because nobody wants another World War II, nobody wants another French Revolution, nobody wants another Black Death, and there are no more slaves to be freed. Um, other types of events that still do occur, like civil war, state breaks down, financial crises, we can show historically do not normally uh, lastingly reduce income inequality. Well, this is interesting because even though history doesn't determine what is going to happen in the future, it is in principle possible that novel mechanisms of reducing in income inequality are going to emerge sometime in the near or more distant future. Well, at the very least, once we take uh, a broader look at the mechanisms that we know have worked in the past, well, those mechanisms are in fact quite dramatic and they only seem to work in very, very special circumstances in the context of very dramatic wars, revolutions, epidemics, uh, that kind of thing. And that's a problem, I think, because, and I can only speak for the US, but if you follow the debate about inequality and what to do about it, the argument tends to be, well, if only people elected the right politicians and voted for the right parties, and they would go and they would pass the right laws and implement the right policies, and that would reduce income inequality. And that's technically true, because that's what happened early in the 20th century, but it's a kind of discourse that ignores the context within which those policy measures were successfully implemented in the past. And those contexts are, in fact, very, very specific. And they are not contexts that we currently have available to us in the world uh, today, in the environment that we currently inhabit, especially in the current context of ongoing uh, globalization. So all of the things being equal, this makes the success of any policy measures that would really have the effect of significantly reducing inequality, well, much more doubtful because they would not occur within the contexts which in the past were um, successful in bringing about uh, this particular outcome. Like I said, this is not going to determine the future, but at the very least, I think it shows that uh, we need to consider history, not just the last few years, but the last few centuries or even millennia in order to get a better understanding of the context uh, of uh, changes in income inequality. And with that, I think I've kept you long enough, so I would like to uh, thank you for your attention.